Hey everyone, it's uh, Kyle Wilson here and I'm excited to have Kevin Eastman with me tonight. Uh, I'm dealing with a few technical difficulties. I'm gonna check on Facebook real quick if uh, this is live. And um, hey, Jeffrey, can you hear me? Type in yes, if you can. And uh, okay, uh, fantastic. And so Kevin, I'm gonna try and add you in real quick. And the name uh, it's live, we're trying to add in Kevin here. So Kevin, uh, this is interesting, my friend. So Jeffrey, uh, I'm trying to add in Kevin and um, I see him, he's in the background. Uh, what Jeffrey? So I'm trying to add in Kevin, and I I don't see a place to add him. Click his picture, which I've done. Okay, there we go. Okay, can you hear me now? I can. So we solved it, Kevin. The issue. Thanks, Jeffrey. By the way, uh, the issue was we had to be live. Okay, and then just share a screen. Yeah. So this is kind of like a, a live basketball game, right? When you have things happen right? That you never know about. Yeah. They say the four most important words in coaching are, well, I can't say it the way they say it, but uh, it, goes like, it goes like this, darn, it's not working. <laughs> exactly. and, and really, sports is about adjustment, right? Yeah, it is. Yeah. And one thing we're talking about all the time is just to be ourselves, you know, be authentic. And this is my second time I've used uh, StreamYard and again, user error, like it typically is when things happen, right? And, uh, but hey, I'm learning and it's just good to have people on. Thank you guys for joining us tonight. Uh, this is actually gonna be part of my Success Habits podcast. So if you don't know me, I'm Kyle Wilson, founder of Jim Run International, your success store, kylewilson.com. And uh, tonight I have a very special guest as part of the Success Habits podcast. If you've not heard the Success Habits podcast, Recent guests have been Darren Hardy, Les Brown, Brian Tracy, Dennis Waitley, uh, John Asaraf. It's not only guys, but we've we've had some iconic uh, guests the last five, six weeks and uh, just interviewed Phil Collin last week with Def Leppard. And Kevin was a guest on our Kyle Wilson two-day virtual event. We, again, several of the names I just mentioned were part of that, Dennis Waitley and, and Les Brown and several others, Tom Ziegler. And Kevin was so impressive. I already knew he was, but getting to uh, hear him for 30 minutes and then us do 15 minutes of Q&A. And I went inside my inner circle group this week and just said, hey, what'd you guys think of Kevin? And it was just so many people sharing some of their big takeaways. So I'm really honored he's with us tonight. In fact, he's got a hurricane approaching him. And he said, hey, I might have a you know, if we have to check out, we'll check out. But the, the weather says he should be okay. But uh, let me give a quick introduction and then we're just gonna start. I want you guys to feel free to ask questions as well. And thank you, Carla, for the kind words. And thank you, Jeff and Nilu. Uh, got people from all over the country here. Um, but Kevin Eastman, he spent 13 years in the NBA. He was an assistant coach with the world champion Boston Celtics assistant coach with the LA Clippers. He also is the VP of operations for the Clippers. 22 years in college as a coach. 11 of those were, he was the head coach of a couple of different universities. Uh, he has been inducted into the high school and college uh, hall of fame. And he's worked with just some of the big names in basketball. He's also a phenomenal speaker, leader, trainer, coach, uh, his book, which I just got a whole box of them to give away is the 28 most powerful word, excuse me, it's why the best are the best. Got a copy right here. The 28 most powerful words that impact, inspire and define champions. Kevin, welcome. 
Well, thanks, Kyle. Um, I think I'm going to uh, bring the level of your guests down a notch after you named all those names. My goodness, you put a little heat on me. You know, uh, what attracted to me uh, in the very beginning was I heard you speak at James Malinchuk's event. And I knew I liked you. I'm like, this guy's really good. He's, he's uh, about principles. He wasn't jumping up and down. He wasn't hyping. He was sharing just things that work. And then he mentioned one of his biggest influences, this guy named Jim Rohn. And at that point, I knew I had to come meet you. And we have just kind of stayed in touch here and there. And then again, I got the, the great honor for you to jump on one of our calls. And you were just, you were great. So thank, thank you for coming uh, on tonight. No, my pleasure. I, I think what you're doing and um, having people share their experiences and um, their successes and their failures. Um, you know, I know you have a, a number of accomplished people on this call and we always think that, well, accomplished people, they've accomplished so much that they don't need to, to listen to anybody else. But I, I think we would all agree, me included, I just happen to be the speaker, right? But me included, uh, I had this insatiable thirst to find out those one or two things that I might be able to add. Uh, because I think what happens is um, many successful people and those who are trying to become successful, it, it's all about knowledge application or knowledge acquisition. And uh, sometimes we stop there. We think because we've listened to somebody, okay, good, I'm good. Now I can go and, and just do it. But I think we have to just put sustained thought and, and, and make it a part of who we are. So there's, there's that knowledge acquisition, but the, the really important part is the knowledge application to make sure that whatever we learn from whoever is sharing that particular evening, we can insert that uh, into our lives and, and how we do things. So, um, you know, I'm humbled to be uh, following some of the guests that you've had and some of the speakers you've had. And, and also I'm humbled to share with uh, the many accomplished people that are on this call. And hopefully I can um, give them more than one idea because I often say this, I know speakers are supposed to say it's a standard line. If I can give you one thing, then I've done my job. No, if I only give you one thing, I stunk tonight. So <laughs> never listen to me again. <laughs> well, you know, your, your book is just so detailed, if you will. You talk about these 25 words and then you go through them one word at a time. And I want to dive into your book, but to your point about application, it's not just the information. You got to apply it and you got to find what uh, fits to you. And I think, Kevin, having you know worked with Jim Rohn and worked with some of these iconic speakers over the years, you know, I got to be intimate, just like you've been intimate with these iconic coaches and players with what it really takes to play at that level. And I think most people diminish what it takes to, to be a professional athlete, to be a professional coach, to, to play at those kind of levels. And when you do, you have to get the skill sets to match it. You can't just go in halfway and think you're gonna last and to you know have played over a decade or coached over a decade in the NBA and two decades in college I'm sure you learned every step of the way. And so was that a big part of your book is pulling from those experiences, those lessons, and then trying to make, make it applicable to the companies you work with and the people you mentor and, and, and uh, speak to? Yeah, I, it, it, what happened was um, ever since I was in college, I kind of just had this curiosity about, okay, why is that player good? Why is that player good? Why is that player not good? They've got athletic ability, but they just don't seem to have it together. So I started my quest and my journey to just find out as best I could uh, through reading and listening and discussing and conversations and debates, uh, how, how did people get to, to where they were? And um, I had the good fortune of coaching in the NBA uh, for 13 years. We won a, a, a world championship with the Boston Celtics in 2008. So uh, I, had a, I had a chance to be amongst the best of the best. And then also that one year, be the best of the best. So along the way, uh, I just kind of kept notes uh, the whole time about what I learned from players, uh, from coaches, even from some announcers. You know, there's some incredible announcers that call professional sports that may be the epitome of the word preparation because hmm. you cannot be a great announcer uh, calling a sports game 
uh, unless you are ultra prepared. So uh, along the way, it just kind of dawned on me uh, a few years back, <clears throat> I ought to put this down on paper. And uh, so I challenged myself, uh, can you do this? You know, I knew I could read a book. I didn't know if I could write a book. And then, you know, the biggest thing, Kyle, was um, I really wanted to make it applicable and insertable. Mm -hmm. So I kept trying to think, how can I simplify this without making it simple? Because I have a personal kind of philosophy that I've lived by and that all championship teams live by. And it goes like this. Um, success lies in the simplicity. Confusion lives in the sophistication. Wow. And our world is moving so fast, whether it be uh, just the speed of change. It's, 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 it's so quick, the pace, that uh, I think when you can simplify things, you can move quicker, right? But you have to, you know, genius is in the simplification, right, as, as Einstein said, right? So, uh, so that's, that's how I kind of wrote the book to try and keep it as simple as possible, uh, simplify it as much as I could so that the reader can immediately insert them, those things into their lives. Because, you know, what, what all the people you said, they all have probably dealt with uh, or, or lived their lives by, by the understanding of uh, success leaves footprints. We've all heard that. But I think there's a step beyond that. I, I, I say after success leaves footprints, you got to do three things. You got to find them, follow them, and fit them. Because yes, some footprints lead you to success. You know what other footprints lead you to? Right in front of Mike Tyson in the ring about ready to knock you out. So be careful where your those footprints are taking you, right? So you gotta find them. Well, tonight maybe they found this guy, I don't know, Kevin Eastman, right? So they found him. Then if they like some of the things that this guy, Kevin Eastman says, then you start following him. Uh, maybe read some newsletters he might have written or some blogs or read the book or, or look at YouTube. And then the key is number three, to fit them. Because you mentioned, you know, Kevin's not a speaker that jumps up and down and spits on the crowd and yells, kumbaya, and we're done. Uh, I don't know how to do that. Like when they introduced me as Kevin Eastman, the motivational speaker, I automatically say, I'm not sure who he just introduced or she just introduced because I'm not a motivational speaker. What I am, I think, is a professional sharer, hmm. uh, and that's kind of been my 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 way uh, in this in this business uh, of speaking is just to share. Um, so those are just a couple of things about how the book is set up and 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 how I came about um, uh, writing it. Because when you are around the best, wouldn't you be dumb not to learn the lessons from the best? I love that, and I remember Stephen Covey said. Simplicity, which is paramount, is always on the other side of complexity. And if you haven't gone through the complex and haven't filtered the ideas and the strategies, then the simplicity is not going to have a lot of teeth to it, right? So like you said, you labored to make it simple, right? And that's what, yeah. and, and that's, you know, Jim Rohn would say, make sure what you say is the tip, tip of the iceberg of what you know. And again, that's why I so appreciate not just 33 years or 35 years of coaching, you've coached with so many legends and it really does come through. If you don't mind, let's begin the early years where you grew up and were you attracted to basketball and just talk a little bit about that. What led you to going to college and, and playing basketball and eventually coaching? Well, I don't really know why I fell in love with the game, but I am so glad that I did. Uh, because I was a shy, introverted kid. Uh, what I found with basketball is uh, to become better at it, you don't need anybody else. What you, what you really need is a boy, a ball, and a dream. So, uh, and, and I had the boy because that was me. I had the ball. And then once I started to like the game, and I just went out one day and started shooting and dribbling and doing that sort of thing, and it was fun. So I said, okay, that's gonna, let's come back tomorrow. And then these tomorrows started to build up. So it went from fun to like, to really like, to passionate, right? And then all in committed, which you have to be if you obviously want to be good at anything. And um, uh, because I made that decision that one day to go out and just shoot around in the backyard, it has led me all around the world. Uh, it has allowed me to, to be at the highest level of, of my profession, uh, which I'm so fortunate to have done. Uh, 
and then allow me to do things like this, which is uh, share all the neat experiences that I've had in my life. But, um, you know, we all have a um, press guide, right? We all have a bio. And here I am. Uh, it looks like it's a nice house. And, you know, I got my rented sweater. So this thing has to end at nine so I can return it. Right. I got my designer T-shirt. Not. It's a regular old T-shirt. So but everybody thinks, OK, well, that guy, you know, nothing's happened with him. Well, maybe the contrary. And maybe one of these things really pushed me forward. And that was my mom committed suicide when I was five years old. Wow. So I don't remember her at all. I'm supposed to, but I don't. So I had to actually interview all of my relatives and brothers, but my family didn't want to talk about it. For, it was taboo for some reason. Um, so uh, I became, I don't know that I became a loner as much as, because loner sounds weird. I became this guy who kind of was in his own head and had to figure things out as himself because my dad was working his tail off to provide for all three of us. Uh, so uh, by being alone, I just, just kind of had to find my way and, and figure out, okay, what did I like? What did I not like? What do I need to stay away from to get to where I want to go? Because, you know, we all have to sacrifice something to get to where we want to go. Um, and I was, you know, whether that was divine intervention coming down on me saying, no, don't do that. Don't get, don't get involved with those kids over there. Just stay on that path of trying to become a good player and it will take you a long way. And sure enough, it did. And then for whatever reason, um, always like another personal philosophy I have, and I think it's helped me anyway. I don't know if it can help those who are listening, but I tried to go through life with big eyes, big ears and a small mouth meaning I wanted to keep my eyes open so I could see examples. I wanted to listen when I was around people who have accomplished something. And, and it could have been a teacher, right? They accomplished becoming one of the 45 teachers at Haddonfield High School. They accomplished something. So I wanted to keep my ears open because I often say this, I already know what I know. And if all I know is what I know, I don't know enough. I need to know what you know. So go ahead, everybody write that down, right? <laughs> I already know what I know. And if all I know is what I know, I don't know enough. So that's why I went with the big eyes and the big ears. And the small mouth is everything I say tonight, I already know. So I, you know, other than repeating it and reminding myself, am I really learning as much as I'm more sharing? So those are just some of the things uh, early on. And I just, you know, lucked into, I, guess, I don't know, maybe I worked into it, but I ended up being good. Uh, and that gave me a scholarship to college. Um, and then I was able to play professionally for a year and then the league folded. Then, uh, you know, again, maybe divine intervention. I saw it as, I don't know anything else I can do. So all the only thing left is to coach. And then I ended up coaching, loving that became passionate about that. And, um, it's led me to here. So, uh, I wouldn't have, well, I would change one thing. You know, I, I, I would have changed my mom, uh, doing what she did, but, you know, and which is a lesson, and then I'm going to be quiet. But, you know, um, as we move on in years, uh, I would encourage anyone, everyone that's listening to, if you have a regret in life, take care of it now. Because I don't know if regret is the right word, but I wish I did remember the things my mom did, like me pinching her and then hiding behind the sofa. I wish I remembered some lessons she taught me. But for whatever reason, my mind didn't. It just closed down. I don't know why. Right. So my point is this. I regret not being able to spend more time with her. Well, I, once she passed, I couldn't change that regret. So I think one of our, our life's journey should not just trying to be successful, but it's trying to re lead a, a regret free life. And if you have some, if you really think about them, there are probably two S's, silly and stupid. Just go and either uh, apologize. Right. Or admit you were wrong. Uh, change the regret and get on with life. And you're going to be so happy you did. Love that, Kevin. And th thank you for sharing that uh, about your mom. I, I would suspect that's not necessarily part of your story when you're speaking mm -hmm. or the majority of people wouldn't know that. And that is kind of a common thing that comes up on the podcast. People really do peel the onion and go there and expose that vulnerability. And, you know, I, I do these different books. We've had multiple book projects and the common theme among most of the people was some sort of tragedy, some sort, sort of hardship. They lost a family. They lost a parent early on. They lived in poverty. 
Oftentimes they're the only one out of their family that made it out, uh, whether it's alcoholism, drugs. I mean, it's just such a common theme, you know, and here we're talking, you know, there's a big message out there about privilege and things like that. But, you know, if we, if we really saw how so many people where they came from, as you said, it's not all this idyllic type of situations. You know, people have had to overcome a lot of things on all levels. And so, again, I appreciate you sharing that. Thank you, uh, because I think some people listening can relate. You know, they can they've had devastation as well. And they'll say, OK, you know, Kevin, he, how he's handled it. He wants to impact people and make a difference. So, again, thank you for the example. Were there mentors that you think helped you early on when you were young that, you know, whether it was a teacher or a coach or maybe even a, a friend's parent that helped kind of keep you in the right direction. Yeah. Well, you know, this isn't, this is not a leadership session tonight, but one of the things that I think is important to be a great leader, my dad was, and that was uh, example leadership, you know, be who you want them to be. If you want to be a leader, you want to be a great parent who, to raise a great child, let them see what they should be. Let them not hear your definition of great for being a great child, let them see it in what you do each and every day. So it started with my dad um, and then my high school coach. Uh, you know, and you remember stupid little stories. You remember when we were kids, we, uh, you know, we had, uh, I guess kids don't have nowadays, but you had pimples on your face. And if you only had one pimple, you know you had 17,000, right? So I remember one time my high school coach going over and actually touching the pimple on my face. I had two or three of them and I was always self-conscious. And he said, I can't believe you had those. I had those when I was a kid too. And I thought to myself, wow, a high school coach can have pimples when they were a kid. So it kind of gave me a way that, okay, I can be okay. As silly and stupid as that was, there were little examples like that through the course of my life. Um, and then because I was a little more shy and introverted when I was younger, um, I may not have gone out of my way to try and find mentors. But what I did find was this, is anyone in the world can mentor you. If you are, uh, number one, can read, number two, can listen. And now shame on anyone in this world who can't have a mentor they'll never meet. Like in, in my sport of basketball. Uh, everyone probably knows the name Mike Krzyzewski, Coach K at Duke. Everyone can learn from him. There's an hour lecture on leadership that he put on uh, at, the, at the business school at Duke, right? There are numerous uh, articles on him out on the internet. So he can mentor anyone who wants to become a coach at anything, really, because he, he, he really transcends sports, right? So I had a bunch of what I called invisible mentors, people that I would never meet, right? And then as I got older, the, the people won't know these names, but they, 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 sometimes you have friends slash mentors or mentors slash friends. And for me, that was Doc Rivers, who I worked with for 13 years in, the, in, the, uh, in, in professional basketball. And then a gentleman by the name of, of George Ravling, um, who was a college coach for a long time. Then he started to work for Nike and uh, became a higher up at Nike and uh, ran their entire basketball division. Uh, which is a big, big position at, at, at Nike. But, you know, it was the conversations for sure. But more importantly than that, the things that came out of their mouth, they lived those things each and every day. So the best part of the mentorship was being able to hear it and then see it, right? It's that big thing about do your actions match your words. You talk about leadership. Any leader out there has to understand every now and then they should look around behind them to see if anybody's following them. Mm -hmm. They may have the title, but they're not executing the position. So um, these great uh, leaders in each of the professions that they were in during the course of my life, uh, they, they left a big mark on me. And thank goodness all of them were good people because I got to see that, hey, you don't have to be a jerk. You don't have to cuss. You don't have to uh, demean people. You know, in sports, you can be demanding without being demeaning. 
you know, leaders in the corporate world, they have to put some demands on their people. Managers do, department heads do, but you don't have to do it in a demeaning way. So I was fortunate to, to, to be around those types of people. I love that so much. We, uh, there, there's a big personality. Uh, I won't go into who it is, but they were a Marine. And, you know, they have that, that's their excuse, right? For whether it's bullying or being off color. And we have a 31 year colonel in the Marines. It's part of our inner circle, Tim Cole. And he's just like you said, he's the kind of guy that does it right. He's a servant leader, uh, you know, does everything the right way. And so uh, I've heard that excuse. I, hey, if you're a head coach, you're going to, that's how they're all going to do it. No, the, you know, I saw a Super Bowl that had Tony Dungy and Lovey Smith, who actually, you know, weren't the coaches that screamed at each other, right? In that same Super Bowl. So I, I, I love that you shared that, Kevin. That's powerful. You know, speaking of some of these iconic people, when I look at your book, I see some of the testimonials from people like Jay Riot. I mean, he won two championships, two national championships in a span of what? Four or five, three years, maybe. Yeah. Three. Uh, Rory Williams, iconic coach at North Carolina. Uh, Eric Spolcha. Spolch, Spolch, I'm not good with names. Yeah. Miami, right? Won a couple of championships. So uh, powerful. There's so much I want to get to. And I know people have questions as well. I kind of wanted to ask you some a little bit off the off the trail type of questions that come to mind. First of all, I'm still not clear where you grew up. Was it the Northeast or what part of the country? Yeah. Um, Haddonfield, New Jersey, right outside of Philadelphia. So were you a Knicks fan or a Phillies fan? No, we were, yeah, well, Phillies, yeah. The Sixers. Yeah. The Sixers. Yeah, yeah. The Phillies or, yeah. or was Maybe that 15 you? minutes from our house? Yeah. So not a Celtics fan. You were no. or a 76ers fan. No, hated the Celtics until I wore the green myself and uh, won a championship. Then I loved them. <laughs> so, you know, here you're, you mentioned Doc Rivers, you know, being a mentor. And in professional ath athletics right now, can you be balanced? Is it possible to be a head coach of a professional team and do the traditional balance? And especially during a season, I know you can't. But everything's become, and you were a college coach, so you have recruiting. Is it possible to maintain balance, do you think? Yes, some level of balance for sure. Um, but the only way you can do it is if you have priority management. Um, you know, I read all the time management books. Hopefully there's no time management authors on this call. If there are, excuse me, ahead of time. Uh, and actually, uh, Kyle, you can actually uh, cut me off if you want to. But uh, I tried all the time management and I found out priority management helped me much more. Love it. Uh, like for me, um, there's certain things. As a matter of fact, you know, uh, Kyle, I'm a big lists guy. And um, like for me, there's seven buckets that I always wanted to fill each and every day. And, um, uh, you know, when I was on that other call the other day, I held the piece of paper up and said, look, this is my PowerPoint. Well, here it is. Uh, but I have this on my desk. And uh, there are certain things I have on my desk that I read each and every day before I start my day. And for me, I have a thing called my controllables commitment. Meaning I am going to commit to these things that I know I can control, whether there's a pandemic out there or not, I can control these things. So my seven buckets, uh, this is what allowed me. And I was not balanced when I was a young coach because you're trying, you're, the treadmill is on 12. And of course we know treadmills only go to 10 because you're trying to prove that you belong in, in this place with some of the, the names you mentioned. So when, for, you're, when you're in college, uh, if you're an assistant, your full-time off-season job is recruiting, right? Everything's about recruiting. So there really isn't that time off. Not not to crack you, but. Yeah, no, no, there's not time off. But you make time to spend a little bit of time in each of the buckets. Okay, yeah. For me, family was a bucket. Yes. You have to fill a little bit of family time. Put a little bit of water in that bucket each and every day. Work has to be a bucket, right? Because that's what gives you your salary. Um, you know, whether you want spiritual to be a part of your bucket, I, you know, I don't know. I won't get into that. Uh, exercise was part of my bucket. I wanted to put a little bit each and every day exercise to keep myself in shape. I wanted to think every single day. 
could be 30 minutes, could be an hour, depending on the day, where it's just me, my thoughts, my pen, and my paper. That's it. I wanted to read every day. And then I had to get a sleep bucket, too, so I could recharge. So uh, that allowed me to try and some, especially later in life, uh, just remind myself, what does balance look like? What does balance mean? But I'm here to tell you early on, no. Uh, because you only know what you know. And back then when I was growing up in coaching, uh, you were deemed a real coach if you worked 23 and a half hours. Yeah. And now you are a stupid coach if you work 23 and a half hours. Uh, and what I found out working for Doc Rivers is you don't always have to be at your desk in the building, in the office. Just get your work done. So I would go during the course of the day in the NBA to areas that motivated me, meaning got my juices flowing. When I w was out in L.A., I might go to uh, a bench that overlooked the ocean. And I got some of my best creative work on how we could improve our team by sitting there, not proving to everybody, oh, I'm at my desk. No, I'm at my place to be the best I can be. That's where Doc wanted us. So we didn't, we weren't slaves to our desks and slaves to our office. Um, and that was important. So, so in that scenario, it takes a coach or a boss or a manager that understands that right? That says, Hey, go off. I, I trust you do what you need to do. You don't have to be, I don't have to have my thumb on you. And so there's some people that don't have that freedom, but they're, they signed up for maybe the wrong plan as Jim Rohn would say. So yeah, I you know, along with that, Kyle, if you have to micromanage, shame on you, you hired the wrong person. Yeah. Why would you hire someone you have to micromanage? And if you have to hire somebody that uh, you always have to re-explain things to, maybe that's not their fault either. Maybe it's a lack of clarity from you as the leader, right? I, so, I'm laughing because in the late 90s, I had John Maxwell come to Dallas and uh, we were having a conversation. I was just talking about all my employee problems. He said, no, that's a leadership problem on your behalf. And it was really life changing. You know, he, he said, people like to win. You, you can't go in every day complaining to them and tell them everything that's wrong. It, it really was a whole other story. I don't mean to go down that path, but mm -hmm. yes, you know, that was totally on me, you know, and so it all, it all does start from the top down. No question. No question. And, um, you know, we always tried to have this philosophy as coaches because it's so easy to point the negative out, you know, Pointers, there's there's a thousand of them in this world. Solution providers, there's not many of those, right? Anyone can point to finger and say, that's what's wrong. Like that's why with, with Doc Rivers, when I was coaching with Doc, um, whenever I brought a problem to his desk, I always brought a minimum of one and usually two solutions. Now he could say, Kevin, those are the two dumbest solutions I've ever heard in my life, but at least he knew that I was not just gonna bring problems because Hey, the only the only things that ever get to a leader's desk are problems, right? That's that's why they're called leaders. But you have to sometimes catch your people doing something right. That's really important today, uh, especially in the environment we're in right now. I mean, every time we turn around, it almost seems like there's no hope. And one of the biggest things we can do as coaches, leaders, uh, is provide hope for our people. Um, so uh, you know, I think it's important uh, that that. That, that we we are positive, not fake positive, right? But but truly positive. You know, what people often, you know, one of the biggest things we found out uh, in leadership in sports is, is people want to be appreciated. You know, I'll never forget, I was with, uh, I was doing a consulting thing for a professional team and one of the other consultants was the, at the time, president of Oprah Winfrey Network, right? And, um, one of the stories he told Logan or yeah, yeah, Eric. Yeah. One of the stories he told us was that, you know, a lot of people, when they get hired there, they always want to ask Oprah one question. And the question is, Hey, when they go to break, when they go to commercial break and all of your celebrities that are on the show, lean over to you and you guys start talking like Barack Obama and uh, 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 Bill Clinton and Beyonce and, and JLo and all these like unbelievable people who never have problems. Uh, when they lean over to you, what do you guys talk about? And Oprah said, 99% of the time, you know what they're saying to me? They're asking, 
was that okay? Did I do okay? Did I answer your questions? Yeah. Even those people need to be uh, appreciated and recognized and valued, right? So um, I digress. So get me back on track. No, I love that. I'm going to say some quick hellos. You know, we had a little trouble getting started. So most of these are inner circle members that heard you and they come back for more. When you spoke a couple of weeks ago, we got Jeffrey Miller, Mark Livingston, Neelu Gibson, uh, Carla Hudson. We got people calling in from all over the country. Uh, I see uh, Lee Newton up in Michigan, Corey Huddleston. We have Ken Walls, who helps me on StreamYard. You, you might know Ken. If you don't, I need to introduce you. Uh, Melinda uh, Sizer. And I saw a few, uh, Kelly Calabrese. And Leonard Wheeler, who played in the NFL for nine years, it might have been longer, wide, wide receiver, and he's been part of one of our books, Andrew Hall. Oh, wow. Se several others. Thank you guys for being on tonight. And so, Kevin, you know, you were talking about uh, leadership, and and I know for you, again, back in the NFL, being a coach it really is about being a leader. I mean, you got to be a strategist. You have to know basketball. You have to know fundamentals. But ultimately, you're leading your players and you're having to lead your assistant coaches, right? And yeah. you're also having to communicate a little bit of a press agent. There's no getting around that, right? There are politics with how you show up and communicate. And on the call you did a couple of weeks ago, you expressed the amount of uh, care and intention you put into the relationships with your players and trying to help a player and trying to really relate and do everything you can on your end to help them uh, again, wh whether it's their heroes or just getting to know them and then being able to use that in such a way to help them become a better player. You want to talk a little bit about that intention. You're not just preaching at them, you're yeah. actually getting, getting in the, you know, in the weeds and doing the nitty gritty to get a better outcome. Yeah. Well, first thing, a uh, disclaimer, this is water. Just so <laughs> everyone knows. I, when I took that last sip, I thought, gosh, I wonder if they think it's beer. Uh, this, no, it's water. This is coffee, just so everyone knows decaf. Okay. Okay. So I wanted to get that out there. All right. So lots of stuff to unpack there. You know, I had mentioned the word example earlier when I, I said Doc's a great example. Doc and all the mentors are great example leaders. I'm going to give you uh, an acronym, which when I speak on leadership, to both the corporate and sports world, uh, I speak about this. Uh, it's called real leadership. You know, what you what you need when you're actually walking the hallways. It's one thing what you need when you're reading the book. But sometimes the book doesn't tell us what to do because it we've never been in that situation. Whether it be for me, a seven footer coming into my office, seven foot one, 260 pounds, walks in and on his third step, he crumbles to his knees and starts crying. I went to all my leadership books. <laughs> there was no solution, right? So how do you work with people? You know, I often get asked in my corporate talks about, I usually get this question and probably all you guys do too, uh, men and women that are listening, but you know, we have this employee, high performance employee, but we really like they're wacko. We don't know what makes them tick. Well, uh, you know, we don't really care what makes our people tick. I know the books say you're supposed to care what makes your people tick. That's third on our list. We actually do care, but there's more important things than tick uh, uh, that, that are important to leadership. So we don't care what makes them tick. We care what makes them talk. Because if we can get them to talk, we'll have an opportunity to probably find out to a greater degree what makes them tick. And number two, we don't really care what makes them tick. We care what makes them listen. Because if we can get them to listen, we have a chance to maybe change the way they tick. So how do you get them to talk? How do you get them to listen? And this is what I'm getting at. It all gets back to relationships. Who cares if we have Hall of Fame players on our team if they won't listen to us and do what we've asked them to do to win that game that night? Right. And sometimes, yes, in a timeout huddle, you do have to be a little stern in that huddle because we only have one minute to do the following things. Motivate players, change attitudes, make an adjustment, change personnel, change what defense we are playing, call the next play, calm a player down, pump a player up. That's all we have to do in 60 seconds. So not much. Right. 
You know, we have over uh, uh, 2000 meetings a year, but most of them are anywhere from one minute to 90 seconds. So you have to develop relationships. So let me go through the acronym, real leadership. The R stands for relationships. You, we don't think you can lead people properly unless you have a relationship with them. And that doesn't mean you know every single thing about them, but it's to the point where uh, you're comfortable talking about things to them. Like what I believe right now, Kyle, and this gets us, I don't want to get into this area, but let me just say this. I believe we're going to have a many, many leaders and they've already been exposed, exposed with all of the, the um, uh, talk on race in this country right now. You know, shame on us if we have to say, I don't know what to say. What do I ask? If the, the relationship, like with Doc Rivers, for those of you who don't know, Doc is a, uh, a, a an African-American, a black uh, man, grew up in Chicago. I could ask Doc anything, anything about what's going on today, right? Why? Because we spent time developing relationship. That's enough on that because I don't want to go spend all my time on that. So the R stands for relationship. The E we already talked about, the example. Simply put, be who you want them to be. What's the A stand for? Attitude. You know, right now we need a positive attitude out there. Not Pollyanna, positive. Some way we can provide hope for the people that we lead, right? They see us working our tails off to get out of this, this predicament we're in, right? And attitude, you know, I, sometimes with leadership we think it's, oh, you got to know so much. You got to know this. You got to know that. Sometimes it's not what you know. It's what you bring that day. It's not what you know, it's what you bring that day. Maybe someone's down and you can pump them back up. Maybe we're seeing that, I don't know, maybe this thing may turn again and we're going to see, you know, possibly a shutdown. Who knows? So now we've got to build our people back up. And we do that with truth and we do it with the attitude we bring. And the L stands for listening. Super important to leadership. Now, I'm just going to ask everybody, just in their own minds, just answer this question. How do you lead and how do you listen? Do you listen to respond or do you listen to understand? Right now, more than ever, actually, we need to listen to understand more than ever right now. We need to do it anyway in a leadership position. So for us to, to, to start to become real, true leaders, we want to cover those four things. Sure, we have to have a vision. Vision. Sure, we have to have processes. Sure, we have to keep developing new products. But you know what? Everybody does that. There's certain separators in leadership. That acronym is one of the ways. And then there's what I call leadership Velcro. And I'll be glad to get into that. But if, if not, I'm good with that, too. No, that, that would be great if you did. I, I want to ask a question uh, going back to when you mentioned the, the acronym REAL. And you mentioned attitude. And you said sometimes it's just, you know, whatever it is that day that you have to deliver. And I would ask you, how much do you feel like you have to fill your own tank up? Or what do you have to do every day when you get up to make sure you are in that place? to go uh, not, not, re not react, but to be in a place to, to be your best self. Is, is, that, is that like a meditation time or a journal time or a quiet time? Or do you feel like there's anything like that that's important for you? For me, it's, it's think time, right? Um, you know, I have this uh, little thing that actually nobody knows. <laughs> not even, I don't think Wendy even knows I do, but you know, I, uh, when I wake up, I say five prayers first thing every morning, uh, because I think what, what that does, most of mine are for someone or something else. So it's not self-centered, right? So um, that's important for me to set my day. But there's, you know, there's three sets that you, if you, if we all want to be successful in life, we've got to master three sets. It really, you talk about simplicity. An athlete has to do this. Your workers have to do it. If you have employees, they have to do this. As, as leaders, speakers, authors, entrepreneurs, we have to do this, I believe, three sets each and every day. Just make sure you're okay with each of these three. First one is skill set. Whatever you need to do to be good at what you do, you've got to master that. 
The second set is mindset, which is what we're talking about now. That's how important mind, the, the mind is. You know, um, to win in anything, <laughs> the first place you have to win is not in practice. It's not on the court playing the Golden State Warriors. You have to win in your mind first. Because what, what all the old sage philosophers said was true. If you think you can't, you're right. You can't. If, 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 if you think you're, you're, you're dumb, probably you're going to act like that. Just be careful, right? Uh, so set your mind each and every day. Uh, start out by you controlling your mind, not what you're going to run into that day. And the, the third set is reset. Because all of us are going to have to deal with failure and mistakes. Uh, you know, I know, Kyle you, Kyle, you told me there's people all over the world listening, and all of them have accomplished something. But we've all, and we still will, uh, make mistakes, and we will fail. Here's what I'll say about mistakes. The best of the best, what I learned, they just make new ones. That's what they do. They make new ones. Mm-hmm. If they make the same ones all the time, like in sports, we don't play you. Now, if you lead the NBA in brand new mistakes, we can't play you either. So, but we have that conversation before the season starts. And then what's failure about? You know, I'm going to ask, I'm just going to ask a, a, a question of you. Because so often the reason we fear failure is uh, the embarrassment part of it what it's going to do to us, right? What it's going to make us look like. So if you fear the consequence of failure, can, can you do all of us a favor and do ourselves a favor? If you fear the consequence of failure, put equal fear to the consequence of never trying. What happens if you tried and it worked? Holy heck. Like I'm a living example of that. I was scared to death to get in the NBA. You know, I said this the other day on the, on the, on the, uh, with the inner circle. You know, everyone wants to coach all these Hall of Fame players, right? Kevin Garnett, Kobe Bryant, Kevin Durant, Paul Pierce. But you know what? They put Hall of Fame demands on your knowledge. Hmm. If you don't have Hall of Fame knowledge, they don't listen to you. Why should they? Right? So, but, because yeah, I was afraid to, to see if I could do that. But I'm so glad that I, I feared the consequence of never trying more then I feared the consequence of failing because you know why I got to coach two all-star games, got to win an NBA world championship. Uh, if any of you listening have a chance to win an NBA world championship, do it. And then <laughs> on the parade, if you can go on the parade, do it right. Get on the float so you can see hundreds of thousands of people in Boston. So if you do have that chance, do it. Right. So, um, and then three things about failure. Number one, what's it going to do to you? Stop you or start you. And I know because sometimes it has stopped me. Even though people tell me I've accomplished a lot in my life, sometimes I've been stopped by failure for two hours, for two days. Hey, we're human, man. We leak. Some days we leak confidence. Some days we leak energy. Some days we leak uh, teamness, being a good teammate. We leak. We're human, right? So does it stop you or start you? Do you treat it as devastation or education? Some people treat it as devastation, especially when you're in the public eye. Because when you fail in the public eye, that's tough, right? You get fired as a coach, that's tough, right? And then the last part, we, we kind of stole this from Nick Saban, the football coach at um, Alabama. He's got a great term, great saying, great mantra, never waste a failure. Losers waste failures. Winners educate themselves from failures. So the leadership Velcro, you ready for this real quick? Yes. Okay. These are separators. You know what leadership is about? If this is, I'm trying to figure out how this comes over on screen. Okay. This is the leader. These are the followers. Leader, followers. How do you get those followers to stick to you so that, they're going to follow you, right? I call that leadership Velcro. These are the separators in today's world, I believe, after studying some of the best coaches and, and even some of the CEOs and, and VPs that I know that are close friends, right? Velcro number one, humility. Humility. 
you can still lead and be humble. Doc Rivers is that. Steve Kerr is that. Pete Carroll is that. Right? Uh, I'm not going to get into politicians that I believe were because who knows where that could go. Right? But you can probably, uh, you know, a, a friend of mine, Carl Lieber, who was the VP at USAA, humble, humble guy. Right? High level, big time company. You can be humble. Second, vulnerability. Right? Here's the big thing with a team in the corporate world and in sports and more so in the corporate world. As a leader, you know, you don't have to have all the answers, but the answers should be in your building. Mm. So be vulnerable. Let those answers come through. When I first took over as the vice president of the Clippers, we took over for, I'm not going to get into it, but a culture that was a culture of no, N-O. Yeah. So I tried to figure out, like everything that they were asked, hey, how about if we could, no. Do you think we could? No. I got a great idea. No. So what are the people going to do? They're going to stop even giving you their best self. So I said, okay, in my first meeting, how can I grab their attention to let them know that this is going to be different? So I said, okay, I got it. I didn't know if it was going to work. It did, but I didn't know. I said, guys, I need to tell you, ladies, because I was in charge of the whole basketball side, men and women, uh, all the workers as well. So I said, um, you know, I know it's been a tough time these last few years because some of you have told me this. But I need to tell you, one of the staples of our culture, and we are going to live this every single day. You guys get me? We're going to live this every single day, and it's going to be great. We are going to have a culture of no. And I could just see all the air go out of the room. <laughs> and then I said, but you know what? Under Doc Rivers' leadership, we spell that word differently. The old regime spelled it N-O. The way we spell no is K-N-O-W. We want to know what's in your head. When you have an idea, you have to let us know. Because I'm here to tell you as the vice president, I do not have all the answers. But I've seen you guys work already. I know what you're capable of. The answers are in this room. Don't be afraid to, to, to let me know a good idea. So you got to be vulnerable. I believe this likability is a separator. I know you're supposed to have, uh, they've got to trust you and respect you and nobody cares if, they, if, you, if anyone likes you. Well, I don't know. There's not a whole lot of people on the list of mine that I respect that I also hate. Yeah. It doesn't work that way for me. Yeah. There must be some level of like, and you know what? Likeability is the easiest one. Just be cordial. Just be nice in the office. When you pass somebody in the hallway, you know what's the most important thing people want to hear sometimes? That you know their name. Yeah. Right? And then the last two, the last uh, number four is empathy. It's a separator. As leaders, we walk in two pairs of shoes each and every day. The first pair are the ones we put on in our closet. Man, do they fit comfortable. The size fits. The style fits. I love the color. Man, when I go out of my house, everyone's going to notice my shoes. But there's another pair of shoes. Those are the shoes that are in your employees' closets. Yeah. You may wear an 11. They wear an 8. They don't fit real well. They're uncomfortable. But you got to learn to wear them and walk in those shoes, too. And that's what we need more than ever right now. Empathy. right? Just knowing. Like a Doc Rivers. Right. As I told you, he's a black uh, gentleman. He would tell me the story of uh, how even to this day, sometimes in New York City, when we're playing the Knicks, the light goes from green to red. He walks across the street in New York City. He hears the doors lock. Come on now. He hears the doors lock because they don't know it's Doc Rivers. They see just this black guy. Maybe he had, does have a hood on because it's snowing out. And then he takes the hood up. Oh, Doc, on click. Right? We haven't walked in those shoes. We haven't walked in those shoes. Have empathy. And the last one is your values. Right? Just your values. I think people follow people who have good and high values. And let me just say one thing about values. And I've been talking so much, i got to stop. Um, you know, values aren't things you have on the wall. Values aren't things that you have in your mission statement uh, booklet that you send out to, to, to all, all the people around the country. 
you know what a true core value is? Something you're willing to be fired over. Mm. That's the core value. It is so strong that if someone comes in and says, whether it's your board or your boss and says, or your athletic director or your owner in pro sports, hey, we want you to cheat in order to succeed. I, I can't do that because integrity is one of my core values. So they're going to have to fire me. Now, my dad taught me well. He taught me never quit because then they don't have to pay you. Make them fire you, right? So I'm not dumb. But my point in a serious mode is this. How, what are your true core values? Because when people know them and they see you actually live them each day, man, that's when, that's when Velcro happens. Wherever you go, they're behind you. Whatever you say, they're willing to do. Whatever demands you put on them, boom, we'll accept those challenges. So just a couple of things. I didn't know this was getting into leadership. Well, well you know, uh, Kevin, this is so, so awesome. And how are you doing on time? I, I don't want to abuse our time. Are yeah, you okay? I'm good. I mean, if you have, if you have listeners and, and they want to keep going. Um, yeah, my, my podcasts tend to be long form. So I, I love this, but I don't want to abuse your time. So I, you know, what you just said, there were so many great things. And again, we said earlier, Jim Rome would say, uh, you know, when what you say is the tip of the iceberg of what you know, and that's what we're getting with Kevin. There's so many questions I could have with Kevin about this book. No matter what, you got to buy the book. Why the best are the best. You know, he's the most humble guy. He's not going to be pushing anything. I'm going to push it, though. You got to get this book. It's very detailed with amazing things, 25 powerful words that impact, inspire, and define champions. Kevin, I'm just going to keep asking questions. They might not be related to the book, and I know you don't care either way. But uh, just side note, when you mentioned humility, you happen to mention, the, I think, Steve Kerr, Pete Carroll, and Doc Rivers. And my son just told me when I was telling him uh, you were going to be on the show, he was telling me the podcast that they do, that Pete Carroll and Steve Kerr does. And they just had Doc Rivers. And Doc talked about growing up in the suburb of Chicago. His dad was a policeman. And, you know, just the things his dad would tell him, right, about what not to do and uh, to be really careful. And But do you listen to that podcast? And do you have specific podcasts you like to listen to? Yes, I, I did listen to that uh, podcast because if you have a chance, even though he's a coach, if you ever see that Doc Doc Rivers is speaking, invest that time because he'll come up with a couple of things that you'll be able to utilize no matter what uh, field that you're in. Um, so I actually kind of surf, I guess you'd call, and yeah. when I see a topic or a person, I don't necessarily follow one person all the time. Um, so that that's kind of how I do it. If I see articles, you know, I, I probably read the first paragraph or so to see if it grabs me. I'll scan it, scan it real quick. I've gotten really good at that. Uh, so that's how I do it. You know, we're all different, whatever works for us. Uh, but again, it gets back to that. It's great to keep acquiring knowledge, but, you know, I know they say knowledge is power. I totally disagree with that. <laughs> I totally disagree with that. Knowledge applied is power. Knowledge itself is knowledge itself in the same head all the time. So uh, I, I would say it's more about that knowledge application. So that, that's such a good point. We always say, uh, I know like when I speak, I, I always say it doesn't matter what you know, it matters what you're doing. And oftentimes the person that's, they've read the book, they, they've heard it before, they're not even listening because they think they know it, but they're not doing it. And so it can actually be a negative sometimes, right? When we, yeah. we, we think they're one and the same, but they're certainly not. Hey, I want to go back to the Clippers. So that was uh, a challenging situation going on at the time. And when you took on the VP of operations and when you were describing meeting with the staff and, uh, you know, the, your passion, you, this, this passion started coming out when you were talking about uh, talking to them. When you took on that role. How much of that was a challenge for you? How much of that was just you knew you had to say yes? Uh, what was behind that decision? And uh, did it make you better? But like, what was that three years like that, that you did that? Made me white hairer. Uh, 
So, no, um, you know, I, I said yes to Doc asking me to do it. Uh, you know, we some of the listeners may know that we, we, we had a previous ownership or a previous owner and uh, he was banned for life from the NBA. So for us, that wasn't the culture that we really wanted to be a part of. So my main thrust uh, when I took over the VP position <clears throat> was to kind of put Doc's culture in mm -hmm. and, um, uh, and, and really kind of rally the troops because we had good people. Um, but what we found out because it was so negative and so no oriented and really there, there wasn't, there didn't seem to be a culture, but we got to be careful because if there is no culture, you know what there really is? A bunch of cultures. Mm. There's a culture of four people over here, a culture of this department and this department only over here. And all of a sudden we were not a team. We were competitors in our own building. Right. And we always used to say, look, we're going to have a, we're going to have an enemy every night. The enemy just can't be in this locker room. Right. So we have to be a team. So for me, the reason I did it, to be quite frank with you, is because Doc asked, you know, that's how strong our relationship was. My big thing was I'll do anything that can help this program and help Doc be the best it can be. So if that meant leaving the bench, which I loved, and going into the what they call the front office or a minute, you know, a VP position, uh, then that's what I would do. And um, you talk about sprinting because I was never in those positions. I thought you were just supposed to figure out okay, now I have a bigger desk. So when I put my right foot up, do I put my left foot over it or should I put my right foot over my left foot? I didn't, you know, and then all of a sudden all this junk came on my, I don't know why I almost said a New Jersey word. All this stuff came on my desk and I thought, man, is this what these positions are about? So I had to start learning how to have, you know, one of the biggest things was how to have, I call them courageous conversations, difficult conversations. Because when you take over and you're trying to change a culture, unfortunately, you're going to have to eliminate some people. And that's not my nature. I don't like doing that. So I came up with a strategy on how I would frame those situations. I called them <clears throat> courageous conversations. And um, for those of you who are maybe looking for something in that area, um, there was a couple of things, and these were the guidelines when I had to have these really difficult conversations with people. Uh, number one, I wanted to talk in, uh, well, number one, I wanted to be direct, not beat around the bush. That's not a beat around the bush meeting. They wouldn't want it, and you certainly shouldn't have. It. Number two, I wanted to deal in facts, not opinion. Okay. Uh, number three, I wanted to deliver my message with respect and empathy. Now, I often get asked in corporate settings, empathy, why would you be empathetic? I said, now, remember what I said? I said, empathy, not sympathy. I'm not going to sympathize with them. Hey, we told you you had to improve in this area. You didn't do it. I'm not going to, like, play the fiddle for you or the violin. I'm not going to sympathize, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to be empathetic. Now, number four, don't even write this down, people, because none of you probably are going to want to do this. But it gets back to your definition of leadership. For me, one of my definitions is to try and help your people to be the best they can be in whatever they're about to go into. It could be they're about to go into a big sales presentation. It could be they're about to go in and hire some people for their department. I wanted them to be the best, whatever they were going into next. Now let's think about this. You're about to fire someone. So, I did this. I said, okay, they got in their car happy as could be this morning. Cup of coffee, maybe Starbucks, came on in, came through the gate, whistled their way up to their desk, and all of a sudden, Kevin's assistant or somebody, one of our coaches said, hey, you have to go see Kevin about something. Now, this walk is a little slower. Like, he never calls anybody in. Why is he calling me in? So now, empathy now, walk in their shoes. Now they sit down. Now you go through the whole thing, and by the end of the meeting, they found out they're fired. This is where real leadership comes in. I let them vent, hmm. right? Why? My definition of leadership, one of, the, one of the bullet points in my definition is to make them the best they can be at what they're about to go into. 
What were they about to go into? Their car. Why? Because they were driving home. So what? So what? They're about to see a spouse, a child, their best friends down the street, their neighbor next door, and they have to tell them they just got fired. I would rather them take 80% of their venom out on me and only take 20% home and throw it on their spouse, their child, their neighbor, right? But so the number four, you got to figure out, like, I didn't know what was going to happen there. Now, if it got really, like, bad, then you have to stop it. But if they drop, you know, one F-bomb, I went back and reviewed my whole life. I've heard it once before, so I can take one, right, or two, but they're really, they, they just lost their job. So, but I wanted those other three to be, be guidelines each and every time I did that, because for me, those were courageous conversations. I really, well, did I had to muster up the courage to do it, because I didn't like doing it. Yeah, no. Uh, what was number two again? Okay, so you had to be direct. I had to talk and uh, 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 deliver it with uh, respect and empathy, truth and facts. Yeah, right? facts. got it. Yeah. I was still writing down the first one and I didn't get the second one down. But so, no, that's powerful. And when I see people commenting, I recognize several of the people that are in either corporate jobs, have a big, huge team of leadership, getting a lot of great comments from people about how helpful this is. And your quote, no, when you have no culture, that means you have a bunch of culture. That's powerful. I mean, I think, again, there's been a lot of people thrown into corporate uh, dynamics because, you know, teams shift often and uh, that's probably the case. So that, that was, uh, I've not heard that quote before. So that's very powerful, Kevin. Yeah, it probably wasn't said the most eloquently no, I liked it. It was good. You know, a bunch of cultures, but you'll have multiple cultures for sure. Well, multiple cultures. Yeah. Very yeah. Good. You just got to be careful. Um, and there's cultures of destruction now, too. You got to be careful when you take over because there could be some <clears throat> existing, like uh, a culture of whisperers. <clears throat> Excuse me, whisperers. If you have a lot of whisperers in your office, the ones that get by the coffee table and they're, Shh. you know what? I've heard a couple of those meetings. And none of them are ever, oh, I really love working for this person. He is so good. When they feel that way, they're going to say, I really love working for this person. When they're whispering, you better find out what they're whispering about. Because that's a, that's a, some people call it a click. That's a subculture. And what you find out is no matter if it's in the corporate world or in sports, anyone who's a malcontent, be careful. They're the best recruiters in your building because they don't want to live alone. So they're going to try and bring other people in. Yes, uh, she leads with, with, you know, I hate her. You know, I often said this to leaders. If you would just go to your local Starbucks, you would find so much by sitting at a table, listening to all the people who you lead talk about you. Man, coffee's a, an incredible thing. It's amazing what I've heard in, in I, I you know, I keep saying to my wife, I'm going to write a book called Java Lessons because there's so much stuff you hear. Like I've heard like, I, I can't believe my manager. How dumb was he? This is what he said in the meeting. Now, what if I was the best friend of the manager? So you got to be careful. You yeah. know, everything you share leads to two more questions. So that's the, I keep having all these, uh, you know, fork in the roads. Where do I go from here? But, uh, let, let me just play off that a little bit. So when you used to recruit, I know it's not the same thing, but as a college coach, you're out recruiting uh, in the NBA. I don't know how much of a impact you had on deciding player personnel or things like that. Again, talent's important, but we also know attitude is, is someone going to be a, a good influence? How, you know, are you pretty strong about, some uh, just some things that are non-negotiable if you see certain things in a player or do you think again it's this fine line is that changeable uh i i look at even like dak prescott with the cowboys the reason he fell to number three is he'd had an altercation i think uh a, a driving and drinking and that's why he fell so far but he's turned out to be one of the great 
team leaders, one of the great guys in the locker room. So it's not an exact science, right? No. So just kind of a, you go by your gut. What, what's some of the things when it comes to recruiting and player personnel on what are most important to you and some non-negotiables and things like that? Well, I think, first of all, you have to spend a great deal of time when you take over a program uh, or a department and really hammer out in your mind, what's the fit? Who fits, who can thrive in this culture, who can thrive under these values, right? Because ultimately I know, boy, I'm killing all the books and mine stinks, so don't worry about it. But uh, all the culture, all the culture books obviously say the culture is number one. Culture eats everything for lunch, breakfast, and dinner. Well, I might argue that culture is third on the hierarchy of successful organizations. Now let me explain. Okay. So important. Right. So let's take a grid with four parts and uh, and let me go through it because uh, it'll get me to why I said what I said. Um, everyone, it's a no brainer. All the leaders on this call want great people, great culture. No brainer. Let's take the extreme opposite. No one wants horrible people, horrible culture. You can't win. Great people, great culture. You can win championships however championship is defined in your industry or your company, right? Or my team. So let, it's the other two where really things start to come into focus as to what's most important. You can take a uh, uh, bad culture and have great people and you still might be able to survive a little bit. That's what the Clippers were doing. They still won, even though it was a toxic – the last year, Vinny Del Negro had a winning year. They had really good people in the organization. They had good guys on the team. They started to get that fit right, right? So you had bad culture, good people. Now, let's flip it. Bad, great culture, horrible people. They're taking that culture down. Yeah. So what's the, what's the common denominator? What we think is number one, the people, yeah. right? How do you choose your people? your values. We don't want like-minded people. We want values of, of kind of, they have to see, they have to live the values we live. They have to feel that the values we have are important to them too. That was the number one thing in our fit. And we can value different things. You know, I do a value audit every year and sometimes twice a year. I just write down on a piece of paper, everything I value about people, teams, whatever it could be. Like my, my latest list has uh, 78 values. And people say, you can't have 78. Well, yeah, you can, because I, I don't know which one to take off. Now, are there core values? Yeah, like integrity I already mentioned. So you have to find the fit. And then you in your own mind have to figure out what the non-negotiables are. Like, uh, we don't want players who play the victim. Right. Meaning they're the blamers. Right. Whenever anything goes wrong and generally speaking, your culture is one of accountability or blame. That's usually what we find. Successful cultures are accountability driven and truth driven, by the way. We haven't even talked about that word, Kyle, but truth. Right. And then uh, usually average to below average cultures are uh, blames, blamers or victims, you know, playing the victim every time something goes wrong rather than finding the solution. So we wanted to, we, we did a tremendous amount of intel background work. You know, I don't know that corporate America either takes the time, has the time, or even wants to do it, but we would go back to, gosh, if it was a lottery pick, we'd go back to junior high. What type of kid were they in junior high? Then what type of kid did they become in high school? Maybe they were a good kid in junior high because they were under the pure direction of their parents. Then they got to high school, got to be pretty good as a basketball player, got cocky, maybe did some things they shouldn't have done off the floor, right, around the community. Then they got to college and they started to see, wow, everybody here is good. And then maybe they got back into who they were when they were younger. So that trajectory says that they go from high school to college, they're going like this. Then when we take over, we think we can kind of keep them going in that direction. But if they were a great kid in junior high, a great kid in high school, then all of a sudden just became a complete jerk in college, red flag, red flag. 
So we did tremendous intel. So things that were non-negotiables for us, you had to have for sure good court character. You had to be a teammate. We wanted guys who, uh, uh, we called them black type, black top players. They didn't care whether the gym was hot or cold. They just came in and practiced. The environment had nothing to do with what they were going to get out of the day that day. Right. So they were, they weren't victims. They weren't blamers. Right. You obviously have to have a level of talent that starts it. So whatever it is for you, you just, but what my point is this, you have to spend a lot of time. What fits, what is a true fit for you when you lead those people? And then the second thing is like Kyle said, what are you not going to budge on? Like if someone lies to us, that's, that's a non-negotiable. Right, that's a non. You, you you don't do that, right? You you will you, there, there will be some consequences, right? And then if someone puts themselves above the team off the floor by doing what they like in the bubble now, if someone just goes out and continuously goes downtown Orlando to the bars and all and that scene, what he's saying is, I don't care about you guys. I want to have fun. No, no, that's a non-negotiable, man. Right. So, um, so, so that leads me to Kevin, uh, again, if we're thinking the NBA, uh, but this, uh, I know this is applicable to so many people. You can have your values. You can have your, uh, culture that you want to bring in, but if the culture above you isn't going to allow you, like they're going to say, yeah, 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 yeah. They'll, they'll talk about it, but can you can you actually create a culture if the culture above you isn't living that culture? And when people find themselves in that type of predicament, I know it's probably not a black and white answer, but have you, have you found that that, that's probably a non-negotiable value for yourself? Well, to me, that's part of fit in sport. They call it alignment, alignment, your owner to your general manager, to your coach. They all have to see things, they have to see the vision of the organization the same way. They have to see the path to the vision relatively the same way. Right. Um, they have to see uh, what they're willing to spend to get there. That's an important piece in pro sports. Right. Mm -hmm. But you have, to have that alignment, AKA the fit. Like when doc uh, or any coach goes after a job, he has to really figure out, okay, do I fit what, what they are? Right. So, and if you have to force the fit, I'm not sure that that hire should be made or that, that someone should take the job. And people could say, well, well, you know, the previous ownership was the previous ownership and Doc took that job. But I'm here to tell you what he was told was that he was going to have tremendous control over everything, right? Sort of thing. Yeah. Not everything. You can't have control over everything, but uh, he felt comfortable with it, that he could change it. But you have to be careful, you know, even at Doc Rivers, you can't, like the zebras don't always change their stripes. Yeah. Right? You, you, you have to be, you have to be careful. Um, so, but, you know, you just have to figure out if that fit is there. And yeah. how do you figure that out by the questions you ask, by the intel you do? Yeah, and I'm kind of thinking more in the corporate world, not professional sports, where, again, someone's working for a big company and they are all about what you're talking about, but they also know there's limits, right? They can't promise things that they don't have control over. And I've just seen that a lot, right? Where from the top down, it's just not a great culture. And that's why they have culture problems and they create a mandate, help us with the culture, but you're a little bit powerless, right, sometimes can create your own little uh, pocket there. I, there's a question and you can address that or not, or address both with this question I wanna bring up. And this is from Nilu, and she's in corporate. And she uh, said, I am recruiting 11 people to join my department. How can I read authenticity versus what you want to hear at interviews? Any probing questions you can suggest? Um. Well, first off, I read body language a lot. Okay. Uh, I, that, that, that's really important for me anyway. And some people, you know, it's not important to them or they, they just, it's okay. I mean, maybe you're just not good at it. 
So that would be number one. Number two, uh, I'm a big believer in depth. Uh, like I, you know, and I'm different. So uh, like I might in an interview say, if they give an answer, I might say, no, come on. You can't, there's no way. Like, look, this isn't being, I would say, this isn't being videoed. Come on, you can't, that, you can't believe that. You know, I might say that or, uh, boy, you know, I, I am a little slow. You'll learn that if you come here. I'm a little slow. Can you go deeper with that? Or, wow, that's an interesting thing. Tell me, like, how did you formulate that in your mind? I think that's such a great answer you just gave. Like, what did you start with and how did you get to this? Because if they're fumbling and tripping and all that, they read something last night that said, if they ask A, the answer is C, right? And then sometimes I'll ask similar questions later on with a real keen ear to see the difference in answers. Um, and I'm not trying to get over on people, but um, I, I just want to see what, what really, you know, because like for me, I, I could tell sometimes when people memorized answers or it was really inside them. Yeah. Like even take this, like, let's say people liked, uh, I don't know, 10 of the bullets that were thrown out today. Well, if they memorize those bullets, oh yeah, humility, vulnerability, <laughs> got it. And then when the, sh the, uh, the excuse me, the doo-doo hits the fan, when the doo-doo hits the fan, if you just memorized them, they ain't coming out. What you gotta do when you leave here is you gotta internalize them. Spend a lot of time and thought on, okay, I heard that, what does it mean to me? So I wanna take that depth I'm going to make those people go deeper in their answers. I love this, Kevin. I, you know, I want to be respectful of your time. Uh, I'm going to have two more quick questions, then we'll wrap it up. Uh, if people want to get your book and everyone listening to this, I know they're going to want uh, your book. And by the way, well, let's give the link and then I'm going to share something real quick. But what's the best way for them to get the book? Yeah, you can go to the, uh, our website, kevineastman.net. And then if you need to reach me, it's, we're not real creative here, Kevin at KevinEastman.net. So, and that's E-A-S-T-M-A-N. And it's K-E-V-I-N, not K-E-L-V-I-N. So KevinEastman.net. And you can see on there, there'll be a link to the book. And we generally, we've been told we get them sometimes to, to people faster than Amazon. We just keep a stock here. You got them really fast to me, and I, I bought a bunch, guys. And so here's my little thing. I give a lot of books away, and I can't tell you. Uh, I was We were on a call last week, and Eric Worre pops on. Eric Worre is going to have, he said, 50,000 people at his next event. I mean, Eric is massive. Wow. Eric, he sent me 10 books back in 1994, uh, like this leather-bound collection of books. Guess how many times I've talked about it? Thousands, right? Wow. And, you know, when you give a book away and uh, Kevin, you might could even talk Kevin into signing these. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so I never buy a book. I buy five books. I buy 10 books. I go give them away. And then I, when you hand someone a book, they're never going to throw it away. And if they actually read the book and it and changes their life or impacts them, you guys know back during the Jim Rohn days, I would create books where people would buy a hundred at a time. I have so many stories of people right now in my world that were given a book by someone who bought a hundred books and they bought a hundred books because someone else bought a hundred books and they gave them away and they would do it at events. Now I priced them in such a way that, you know, there was that incentive, but it's a great way to give someone something. It's how I moved 6 million of these, right? Kevin, you know, that story of yeah. the quote book. Uh, because you can sign it. Kevin will sign it. This is a book worth giving away. You guys rarely hear me endorsing books. I rarely endorse anything unless I don't endorse anything unless I really believe in it. And this book's powerful. Kevin's powerful. Uh, so again, someone type in the link and in, into here. It's uh, Kevin at KevinEastman.net or go to KevinEastman.net. Uh, his wife is phenomenal. She'll answer any questions you have. And uh, so, so this has been amazing tonight. So Kevin, um, 
so many different places we could go. Let me ask you this real quick. Uh, by, by the way, were you ever going to be an announcer? Had you thought about that, that transition from NBA to speaker? Were you thinking about being a broadcaster? No, you know, I, um, the travel and the, yeah, well, I just didn't, I, I, I thought I could, um, have a chance to impact, uh, more people if, if I were able to get, uh, you know, it sounds cocky, but impact more people if I can get on stage. <clears throat> so, and that's one of my charges. Uh, you know, I know some people want to influence people. That's third on my list. I would rather impact and inspire. There are two other eyes that come before influence uh, for me. So, um, and, and I enjoy sharing. I, I was, I've, I've been so fortunate with the life I've had. You know, I said the other day, you know, um, we all want to live our dream. Well, I've outlived mine. I mean, why am I like doing this, right? Why is this little skinny kid from Haddonfield, New Jersey, uh, on the bench of a world champion, coaching Hall of Famers, right? So why shouldn't I give it away? I think that the, the worst thing we can do in life is, is uh, hold the knowledge we've been fortunate enough to have acquired and hold it to ourselves. Like, it just doesn't make sense to me. Look, everyone on this call is, as I said, accomplished. So you're, you're not, that, the fun part is give it away, right? Let people know. And maybe you charge for it, but whatever, it's not going to stay in your mind. And then know what the fun part is? See if they can catch it. <laughs> That's the fun part. That's what's keep you going. Yeah. Right? yeah, get that competition. Hey, young buck, here's what I did, but you ain't catching me. <laughs> oh, yeah, old man, I'm going to catch you. Okay, let's go. Race is on. Because you know what I found out? I can wake up at 4 a.m., that young person, that's usually when they come in from the night before. So I already got a head start on them, right? Love that. So so when you see me looking down, Kevin, because some people are sending me uh, messages and questions. So I, I'm looking at my phone a couple of times to respond to those based on this interview. Yeah. Uh, here's another question. Uh, yeah. This is something I always challenge people in my group. And also, I'm always curious on the podcast what is your secret sauce? What like what makes you unique or special? Like what's the thing that you know, okay, if you put me up with X amount of people, you know, this is what makes me special. Um, I can only tell you what, well, I think one thing I know for sure is uh, my curiosity. Uh, you know, I, I've been saying this for 30 years in the coaching world. Uh, there's two types of people in this world. There's two types of leaders in this world. There's two types of athletes in this world. There's two types of, of managers in this world. There are know-it-alls and there are learn-it-alls. Hmm. And I am going to make sure that to the, till the day I die that I remain a learn-it-all hmm. uh, each and every day. That's why I keep what I call my WILT notebook. <clears throat> As you know, I, I'm big on bullets and acronyms, but WILT stands for what I learned today. And my challenge each day is to put at least one entry into my Wilt notebook every day. Then that's going to keep my curiosity gene watered. Right? Wow. So that's how, that's what I believe I bring. Now, what people have told me after I speak and, and that sort of thing is um, we loved uh, the fact that you didn't come in here and you were up here and we were down here. You were authentic. We could tell it was truly what you believed in not what you just, like, I think you can speak from theory, right? For sure. You can speak from uh, uh, what you think is right, or you can speak from, I've been there. I've done it. I've sweated. I walked in the hallways, right? So I lived it. Like, you know, we didn't even get into the words tonight and, and don't need to, but, um, what the readers, what if you end up getting the book, you'll see there's 25 words. But here's the deal: as you see each of those 25 words, you'll say, "Well, yeah, well, I mean, everybody's talked about those words. I have those words in my vocabulary. What's what's new about this? Here's what's new about this. Sometimes the secret sauce is so simple you don't even know it's in the recipe. And mm -hmm. here's the secret sauce to the successful people." They don't just have those words in the, their vocabulary. 
they live those words every day. And there's 25 of them in particular that the best of the best that I've ever been around, when they are interviewed or you're in discussions with them or they talk about what got them to where they are, these 25 words will be part of any answers they have. But again, they live these words. They don't just say them and they don't just have them in their vocabulary. So what is live? Right? You know, there's there's three ends in this world. There's not in, they ain't gonna be successful. There's all in, which is what these guys do, these ladies do. They live these words every day, right? So I I, I think what are you? Are you a not in? Or you're all in, or are you the third part, which tricks people? And as leaders, hey, as you evaluate your team, you have all ins. They're easy to spot. You have not ins. You got to get rid of them. But it's that middle group, man. You got to watch them. You have to watch them because they can kill your company, your organization, your team. They're the givens. You see, temporarily they will give in. Yeah, I'm going to do that for three days. Then they go back into not ins. Is that changeable? Is that a character trait or is that something that can be influenced for the better? Say, I would say, in my experience, more times than not, it's difficult to change. But depending on the position you have in the organization, you can't quit. Right. Uh, we have one of the most powerful words in trying to turn somebody around is the word that Kobe Bryant taught me about what it really meant. Right. And I. I won't go into the story, but the word is until, hmm. U-N-T-I-L. And it's a longer story, but the, the the lesson and the moral at the end of the story is, I asked Kobe, well, how long will you work on it tomorrow? And his answer was, until. And I didn't freeze just then. There was about 30 seconds because I knew there was a comma, more sentence. Nope. Kobe put an exclamation point. So I went to the University of Richmond, unbelievable academic institution, right? As a matter of fact, it is now. I couldn't get into Richmond right now, but I was able to get into Richmond back in the day. So I asked an unbelievable follow-up question. I said, Kobe, until when? And he looked like at me like only Kobe can, like, you idiot. Until! Two exclamation points. And I said to myself, I got it. I totally understand now why Kobe's Kobe. He doesn't work on it until practice is over. He doesn't work on it until it's time to go to dinner. He doesn't work on it until it's time to go to the party. He doesn't work on it until his best friend says, let's go get a a Coca-Cola. He works on it until he masters it that day. So when you're working with someone who you're maybe you're trying to change until the whoever is the decision maker, until they say, nope, we're getting rid of him or her. It is incumbent upon you as the manager of that person to try and find new ways to reach them. Maybe it's your fault. Maybe it's my fault. Maybe I haven't thought about all the ways I can reach that player. So I, as an assistant coach, I would keep working with him until Doc said, hey, we got to trade the guy. Right. So but along the way, I made sure that that person, that player knew the truth. The biggest disservice you can do to someone is to lie to them. And maybe we can even end it on this. The single, if you're okay with this, talking about truth, Kyle? Yeah. Okay. So what we believe is the single most important word in all of success, no matter what you do, no matter who's on this call, I really believe this. And if you have a team underneath you, well, hopefully you don't have a team underneath you. You have a team side by side to you because that's a true team, right? But that team that you work with, if this word isn't a major part of everyday existence there, I don't think you can get to where you want to go. The single most important word in all of success is the word truth, T-R-U-T-H, why? How can we get to where we want to go if we don't know the truth about what we're doing well? Keep doing that. What we're not doing well, improve that, change that, get better at that. The only way we can find that out is if we have a culture of truth, which is part of our culture. That's a non-negotiable, as I said earlier. 
So the truth needs three things. You need to be able to live it. You need to be able to tell it. And you need to be able to take it. If you can't do all those three things as an employee or a leader, meaning manager, VP, you know, if you're in a C-suite or you're a manager, if you can't do those three things, I'm not sure you can be as effective as you're capable of being as a leader. So what do those mean? You got to be able to live it. What does that mean? Simply put, do your actions match your words? Because in a leadership position, like if I was talking to your leadership group, whoever's on this call, one of the things we would spend time on is this word truth, right? Because all of the people you're leading, they're constantly evaluating. These are her words, yet these are her actions, and they're not matching, right? So that's important. So you got to be able to live it. You got to be able to tell it. You know, all of us, whether we're in sport or corporate America, different people take truth different ways. You can't say the same. You can't say things the same way. So two filters. Who and how. Who and how. Who am I telling the truth to and how should I tell it to her or him? We have some players you can maybe even cuss them up and down. You know, believe it or not, in pro sports, every now and then there's a dirty word said. So maybe it comes out in a correction. And that player will turn around and go, I got you, coach. I'll go do that. Boom, they're off. You do that same thing. We had a seven-footer, seven-foot guy. If you did that to him, he became 5'5". Five, five. Hmm. You got to know who you're talking to. Well, Kevin, how do I know who I'm talking to? It goes back to what Kyle and I started with, relationships. Relationships is an investment in success. It's not a pain in the butt action that you're supposed to do. Relationships are an investment into success, right? So you got to be able to live it. You got to be able to tell it and you got to be able to take it. And by take it, I mean everyone in the company, the organization, or on the team. Doc Rivers is willing to take the truth. If a player thinks that something's going wrong, they're allowed to voice that uh, opinion. Now, we voice it with respect, right? The how. The how's important. But, you know, how's Doc going to become his best if he doesn't hear the truth? Like, if he hires me and I don't tell him the truth, why should he hire me? Right? Anyone... Anyone in your hometowns can, I think they can say yes. Who wants somebody who's yes, says yes all the time? If somebody says yes all the time, man, you're a bad hirer. I don't know if hirer is a word, but it is for tonight, right? So, um, so you got to be able to live, you got to be able to tell it, and you got to be able to take it. Two things I encourage everyone to maybe think about uh, putting into their life or how they do things. One is a truth teller, right? Someone who actually will tell you the truth. Um, and that's important. You know, I've been asked to, to coach some coaches, and I'm not going to get into who. Um, but the one thing I always have to ask is, hey, are, are, am I, is it okay if I tell you the truth? And if, if the answer is, yeah, I'm pretty good with that, then my answer is no. They could pay me $9 million. My answer would be no, right? If they're willing to hear the truth, then I would say, well, trust me, I'm going to do my homework and put so much thought to this that what comes out of my mouth is what I truly believe is best for you at this time relative to the situation you asked me about. And if part of that answer is you're not doing this or part of that answer is you tell me you're doing this and then I find out it's not, you're not doing this, right? So... Get truth tellers in your life. And, and some of the people will call that your circles, the circles you travel in. Well, be careful there because I think for many, many years we're, we're using the wrong filter to pick our circles, to form our circles. The filter most people use, and players in particular, and it's, it's not good. It doesn't get them to where they want to go. Most times the, a player will use the filter of what does my circle do for me? Oh, they, when I'm tired, they go out and get my groceries. Oh, if I'm, I'm late, they'll call a, a, a limo to pick me up, right? 
Yeah, they'll do those things for you, but that's not the circle that gets you to success. A circle should be filtered by what they do to you. To you. Do they challenge you to become better? Do they motivate you to become better? Do they tell you the truth so that you can, can, can make that next step in your life? They're doing things to you, not for you. Right? So get truth tellers in your life. And then the other thing would be do a truth audit a couple of times a year. It's amazing how many people don't do this. Like every coach who gets fired, I go through with them if they call me an exercise on a truth audit. It's not that difficult. It actually costs, I think, a dollar and 17 cents at CBS. It's a yellow legal pad and a, a pencil. I mean, if you got a lot of money because you made a lot of money in your previous job, maybe you get a nice pen, right? But the fact of the matter, it doesn't cost anything, right? It just costs your time and deep thought, not your time and thinking, because that won't cut it. Your time and deep, 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 deep thought and true, true, true honesty. And write down all the things that you think you did well, all the things that you were part of the reason why you got fired. Right. Everyone's ready to blame the athletic director and the players. No, man, you had something to do with that. Something you did or didn't do caused you to be let go. Let's dive deep into those whys or, or what those were rather. Right. And then in that circle, if you do have the truth tellers, tell tell them to do that same yellow sheet. And, and have them perform a truth autopsy. You do a truth audit, have them do a truth autopsy. I just made that up, so I don't know if that's I don't know if that makes sense or not. So Kyle, you'll tell me no, don't ever use that again. I'm good. That, that, that's great, Kevin. Uh, I saw some people asking, will there be a replay? Uh, on Facebook, you can play this anytime. It's gonna live on my Facebook page. It's also gonna be on my YouTube channel. Uh, and it's also gonna be part of the podcast. It's, I'm gonna take this and we'll uh, add some bells and whistles to it, and it'll be on the podcast here in a couple of weeks at kylewilson.com forward slash podcast. Kevin, what's the best way for people to get a hold of you? Uh, I know you're on Twitter. Uh, do you know your Twitter? It's Kevin Eastman, right? Yeah, at Kevin Eastman. And on the Twitter, Kyle, so that people know, so you, obviously you see I do a lot of bullets and mm -hmm. uh, quick hit things. It's probably now over 5,000, well, probably 4,000 bullets. And now that I've kind of caught up to this thing they call marketing, I think. <laughs> so disregard the marketing part of it, all right, and just get to the bullets. But it's on teamwork, personal development, success, um, uh, leadership, right? So those types of things, uh, quick hitters that you might be able to use with your team. I don't know, maybe if you speak, you might be able to use it somehow in, uh, in your speaking. So gosh, I could have been with everybody face-to-face. Uh, -face. That would have been fun, but obviously we can't do that. And if every if people want to uh, engage you as a speaker trainer, uh, like what's the other ways people can engage you? Well, uh, for the most part, what I've done is is either talk to uh, leadership teams, sales teams, uh, conferences. Um, I'm I'm pretty. I probably shouldn't be this way, Kyle, but I have to make sure I'm good enough to coach somebody. I don't know if that makes sense. Like it's more, and when people call me, I evaluate, okay, what can I give to them? And if I feel I can't give as, as much as maybe somebody else, I'll actually say, you know what? I think there's someone else out there who might be better for you. Uh, I know you're not supposed to do that, but um, it's just the way I operate. I don't do as much personal coaching. I really have to find out if someone really wants it. Um, because I think that's the only way it can really work. Uh, so, uh, but, so that's kind of how I do it. Um, they send you an email to say, Hey, I'm interested in having you come to my conference. Yeah. Yeah. That's how, I mean, uh, that's how we, we get a lot of stuff just from, um, word of mouth. And, so Kevin at Kevin Eastman.net. Yeah. And right now of late, we've been, uh, I've been asked to do, um, a number of virtuals. Yeah. Uh, and um, so uh, I, 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 I've done those. Um, 
and, and, and we just work it out. Right. So send an email to Kevin about those and uh, make sure and get his book. Uh, and he potentially might sign it for you. you just put the request in uh, at kevineastman.com. And I got two last questions. Dot net. 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 Thank you. Kevineastman.net. And two final questions. I know we're, we've I've kept you a long time tonight. You're on the East Coast. Big storm coming, so thank you. But this is going to live on on the podcast, so i got to ask you two more quick questions. One is, as I said when I heard you three years ago, you mentioned Jim Rohn had an influence on your life. Can you share a little bit about that? Well, when I was a coach, I used to go to one, what they I guess they called motivational conference or whatever they called it, and there was one in Charlotte, North Carolina, um, and that was nearby the college I was uh, coaching at. So I went over uh, not knowing like what I would hear. I was hoping I wouldn't have to jump up and down in my seat and yell kumbaya. So luckily none of the speakers did that. But the guy that just kind of hit me and struck me because uh, A, I couldn't write fast enough and B, uh, every nugget seemed to apply to real life. So, um, you know, the, the, probably the biggest one that has resonated with me among many was uh, like we won the championship and um, let me reach back here. And this is one of the rings that, that I had made uh, and encased in, in glass for, for Wendy and Jake, my son and, and wife. So everyone says, Oh my gosh, like the ring I have, uh, this is embarrassing somewhere in this office. And here's why I've never worn it. And you know why I've never worn it? because of something Jim Rohn said, because hmm. for me, it wasn't about what I won. It wasn't about what I won. It's what I became in order to win this. Hmm. Like the deeper preparation, the, the, the deeper relationships with players, become a better teacher of the game, uh, have, have more efficient word choices, right? Because in sports, the, the game goes so fast, right? You can't talk in paragraphs if you're a coach. You have to talk in bullets. You have to get in and get out because that's how fast the game is, right? So it's not what I won. It's what I became because of what we went through to win this. And that was something that Jim Rohn said. I still have the tapes, not like DVDs, not like streams, those tapes that go, right? And and Wendy and I to this day, sometimes we'll we'll – We'll uh, we'll try and imitate his tone. And the, we'll, you know the, that's what happened. was that 1993 or 94? Yeah, probably it was at the. I, the, I was there. So the, Jeff yeah. was the MC. Uh, Joe Theismann spoke. If I, remember. Yeah. I was there, my friend. Uh, mm, Jeff, gosh, yeah. Jeffrey Gittimer, who's one of the all-time great salespeople, and wrote the little red book of selling. He was the MC of that event. I that was an event I booked. Ah, wow! Yeah. It was uh, impactful on me. Uh, and he, you know, at the time I thought he was old. Sure. Yeah. And I'm thinking to myself, wow, it, this is so neat that this older guy has this energy for what he does. And I'm thinking, how neat is that? Like you could, I can be a coach when I'm old if I still love it. You know, it's amazing what you see and pick up. Yeah, he was probably 59 or 60. I met Jim when he was 59. So, no, he would have been 63. And I always say his greatest success was after the age of 60. He was pretty wow. known at the age of 60. So here's the final question. So, again, the rest of the story, that's great hearing that, that you saw him in Charlotte at 1993, and that's when I met Gittimer. That's pretty cool. Final thing, Kevin, is you talked the other day about legacy and your definition of leaving a legacy. Yeah, um, let me see. That's one of my lists I have, uh, if I can bring it up. And um, let me see if I can get that. Because to me, you know, don't don't get caught in the trap of the, uh, the impossibility of a legacy. I have this sheet, it's on my desk, because I wrote down what a legacy means to me and how I can maybe have one. Uh, so I'll read you, there's, uh, I call it my elite eight, right? And maybe you guys could get something from this as you think about your life. Okay. Because at the end of it, at the end, when all is said and done, like I, I just had two 
one one former teammate and one assistant coach that I had uh, back in the Charlotte area uh, who passed away in these last uh, eight days. Wow. And um, both of them left a legacy. And one of them was the VP, no, the president of Cats Radio. Think of the legacy he made. Yeah. Cats Radio. One was a preacher in Lincolnton, North Carolina. But each legacy was equally important. So here you go. Legacy created by me for the purpose of others. A legacy is for others. When we leave, there's still lessons that they can learn, but we have to create them. So the challenge for me each and every day is to do things right. And whenever I'm in front of someone, actually be in front of them. Hmm. Number two, it's all about doing the next right thing for someone else. A legacy is other driven, not me driven. Like, I don't want to leave a legacy so my name stays around. I want to leave a legacy because somebody said, your time's up. But if my lessons can still help someone else 20 years after I'm dead, hey, that ain't bad. And they say you can look down, so I'll be able to see it, right? Number three, a legacy is all about one conversation, one touch, one word, one person at a time. A legacy isn't speaking in front of uh, Jim Rohn speaking in front of 20,000 people. That's not how he truly left his legacy. Might have been that one person who stayed after and he just talked man to man, man to woman with that, that person. So I'm going to read that one again in support. A legacy is all about one conversation, one touch, one word, one person at a time. A legacy challenges me to have a different mindset each and every day. Is, it, is a legacy all about hearing? No, legacy is about listening. Is a legacy about sharing or holding? No, a legacy is about sharing. Is a legacy about quickness, get in, speak, get out? No, no, no. Legacy is about depth, staying there a little longer, deeper conversations with people. That's how we leave a legacy. Is a legacy about influencing? I don't think so. I think I told you, you know, it's to me, it's about impacting and inspiring. Maybe different for you. Is a legacy about me first? No, it's about others first. Next bullet. A legacy is not just about having success. It's what I do with that. Share it. Most legacies are built on sharing and caring. Right? Not how high you went up the ladder. Right. Next bullet point. Don't fall for the legacy intimidation trap or the legacy doubt trap, meaning I can't leave a legacy. Yes, we all can. The power of a legacy has nothing to do with numbers. It has everything to do with lessons and touches, Hmm. the people we touch and the lessons we leave. And sometimes the lesson is by living the right type of life to someone who will never talk to you, but sees you every day. That can be a legacy left as well. Two more bullets. Legacy starts with the person in front of you, no one else. Now, you know, have I been in talking to crowds of thousands? Yes, but I've also talked to leadership teams of 12. Doesn't matter. Whoever's in front of you are the most important people that you're sharing with. And you're sharing to help them get to where they want to go. You're not sharing, hoping to get where you want to go. Kevin, did you learn that along the way? Did you discover that? Um, Or did you inherently have that type of mentality? I think I just, that's who I am. Because when when I figured out, okay, how do I do this? You know, I've never been asked that, but maybe I started to think about some of the people who, like I always think about, okay, what did they, how did, how did I, how did they resonate with me? Why, why did I stick to them? So. Because you talked about it one time that as a coach, you weren't balanced, you were all in. And um, again, you can only do so many things in a 24 hour period of time. But I, I do think as we progress in life, we get a little bit more 
and the give back type mentality. I just didn't know if this was an evolution for you or not. Well, I've always been a giver. It's just my nature. And I've always, uh, I don't know. I, I think I get juice from giving. I don't know if that's stupid or not. Uh, like I get, like, you know, uh, part of part of leadership, right, is putting gas in the tank. Part of leadership is focusing the lens, right? So when I give to people, I get gas in my own tank. It's just, I guess I have a different tank than other people. <laughs> I don't know. But here's the last part. Okay. Here's the last one. Legacy is left by doing your part in your piece of the world. Mm. Just do your part in your piece of the world. You're a manager of eight people. You have a small company of, of three employees. Then your piece of the world is that group. That's where a legacy starts. It often starts by the people you most are in contact with. So anyway, I hope that can help some people. And um, this was awesome. Oh, gosh. Again, it, it's been good uh, getting to know you better and, and to see your philosophy and to see uh, how you approach things. And it's brilliant. And I know you've impacted people tonight. You definitely impacted me. I kept taking notes, probably about six pages of notes. And that's after I took a couple of pages of notes the other night. Uh, this was great. And I can't wait to devour your book. I just got them a few days ago, so I've not read it, but I'm looking forward to reading it. And I hope everyone goes and gets it. And uh, you were very generous tonight with your time and your knowledge. And uh, I hope people uh, want to go get more of it. And again, phenomenal quotes. Uh, like I, I'm seeing all the, the comments from everyone. So thank you so much, my friend, uh, for giving tonight. No, my pleasure. Keep doing what you're doing. It, it's a, such a neat thing to be a part of. And, and for everyone out there, uh, from my wife, Wendy, and I, uh, please stay safe, uh, stay healthy. And if ever we can help, I don't know how we can, but uh, just hit us up or Kyle has all my stuff and I'll be, be glad to do what I can. Thanks, everyone. Hey, stay safe tonight with the storm. Right. Yeah, thanks. See you guys. Appreciate you. Thanks, Kevin. Okay, everyone, uh, Kevin was tremendous. Go, go make sure and follow him. And uh, I'm going to call it a night as well. Thank you guys for, for being on tonight, all the comments, all the love. In fact, I'm going to call Kevin real quick. That was really, really good. And you guys have a great evening. Thanks, everyone. Netta, Sharon, Jeffrey, Robert. I uh, see so many great comments. Steph, by the way, uh, uh, Jeff and uh, Jeffrey and Emily and Netta and Steph, and Kelly and Sean, I have signed books for you guys uh, from our two days. So I was going to send you a message, but I need to, uh, need to call Kevin real quick. But I will be talking to you all soon. Thank you all uh, for jumping in tonight. We'll talk soon. Bye.